Hey everybody, it's good to be with you again today. Uh, normally I've been uh, filming the videos by myself, but I got a congregation today. Uh, Tammy came along with me, and so uh, missing everybody, but it's good to know that we can still communicate and be able to talk to one another and to be able to preach and to be able to fellowship uh, around the Word of God. I've been listening to, listening to some, some good sermons online on Facebook and and different things and I've really enjoyed them um, I'm really hoping that um, you know God knows what he's doing and everything happens for a reason and so I'm hoping that um, with the virus and everything that's happened it, it's it's going to give us more of a sense of unity than we've had in a long time even though we're separate and God works in mysterious ways but we're just trusting him uh, to do the work. I know sometimes if we've looked at things ourselves and tried to examine them with our own minds and, and with our own reasoning, we end up uh, doubting the Lord. But the Lord said that things would come together, that there would be unity among the church, and we trust that the, that the Lord is faithful and that he's going to do exactly what he said. So I'm excited about, um, about what God's doing I know this is a, is a very trying time. A lot of people are, as been said, I've heard even this morning, people are, uh, they have fear. They're, they're anxious about everything that's going on. And we need, to, we need to abide by the rules and do the things that they're telling us to do uh, to the best of our ability. Um, it's very difficult. Not everybody plays by the, by the same rules, but uh, I know and am assured of that God has everything in control and so we just want to be obedient and we want to follow the Lord's leading guiding of his spirit and so I know God's faithful so let's just say a prayer before we get started I want to get right into the word I'm grateful once again to have this privilege to be able to minister and I'm still getting some good feedback and, and hoping that people are encouraged by it um, again, it's not about us, it's about, about the Lord and, and what He wants. And so let's just say a word of prayer before we get started. <clears throat> Lord, we just appreciate you so much this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given us, Lord, to gather around your word. God, your word is, is our lifeline. Lord, it's the strength, it's our roadmap. God, it's everything that we need in this world. And so, Lord, if we'll abide by the word, as I've heard this morning, not just hearing the word, but Lord, following through, allowing your word to become spirit, to come alive. It's not just hearing something, a letter, a dead letter, but it's letting the spirit um, activate it and bring it to life within our, in our life. And so, Father, we just praise you and we thank you. Bless each one, God, that hears it. Touch those that are sick. Be with all of those, Lord, the doctors and the nurses out on the front line, our health care providers and all of our leaders of our nation and our state. God, we just ask that you'd be with them. Lord, guide us and direct us in Jesus' name. Amen. I told you the other day that the title of the message was The Power of First, and it was from Matthew chapter 6, and I, I think I mentioned Matthew 6, 31 through 34, but I want to go back up as I've read it and studied it this week. I want to go back up to verse 25 of Matthew 6, and I want to read from there. Normally, I don't like to do... A whole lot of reading before I get into the message, but uh, I just felt like this, this need we need to go up on up to 25. So let's start there. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for the body what you shall put on. It is not, is not the life more than the meat and the body more than the raiment. I thought this was so, as I read through this this week, I thought this was so relevant or what's going on today. People are worried about um, the stores and the food chain and all these things, but you know, God, God is in control, and we just have to learn to trust him. Verse 26 says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which 
is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not he much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for tomorrow, for, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I want to go back up to verse uh, 33. And it says, but seek ye first. Uh, I was laying in bed early this morning and just praying and meditating about the things of the Lord and about the message and, and the thoughts that the Lord had put on my mind and and, you know, uh, a, a dear friend of mine was ministering this morning and he was talking about, you know, people telling us how to uh, or telling us that we need to do this or we need to do that. But I want to add to what he was talking about this morning by saying that we, and he said it himself, that we need to know how to do that, not just what we need to do, but how we need to do it. And, and as I was thinking about this, the word seek came to my mind and there was three things that, that uh, I was thinking about is when we seek God, first of all, it has to be intentional. Uh, it's not just something that we stumble upon. It's not just something that, that oh, if I get, chan get a chance through the day, you know, I may read or I may not or, or I may pray or I may seek the Lord or meditate on the things of God. When we seek the Lord, when we seek his kingdom, the very first thing, it has to be something intentional, something that we plan to do something that a time that we set aside that we that we keep our minds in tune with the lord through his word or through songs or through or a sermon or whatever it is that keeps our mind through the day it has to be very intentional the second one is it has to be intense you know we can't let things you know how many times have we knelt down to pray or how many times have we have we uh sit down to read God's word, and we've let so many other interferences. I can't tell you the times where I've prayed, and, and before I know it, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do that day or what happened yesterday or, or the events that's in the news or so many things. And so we have to make sure, first, it's intentional and also that it's intense. And that means we have to focus our attention completely on what, what God wants us to do upon worshiping the Lord or upon seeking God's face or upon reading his word. Let that time that we have set aside, that we have intentionally, purposely set that time aside, let it be intense. Don't let anything uh, around us, don't let the, the interferences of life come in and disrupt that, that continuity that we have in the spirit. You know, so many times that's what the devil wants to do. And that's what he's trying to do now. He's trying to interrupt that continuity of fellowship, not, not just in, in church, being able to go to church and fellowship and, and being able to feel the presence of the Lord, but even in our everyday life, he's trying to break that continuity of us worshiping and maintaining that fellowship with God and keeping that mind of Christ. And so we have to make sure that, that when, we, when we study or when we pray or whatever we're doing, there's got to be an intensity to it. The third one, it's got to be intimate. That means we've got to find out what God wants. You know, I, I was, I've been listening to a, uh, uh, an audio book and, and, the, and the guy that's talking, he says, you know, that, that we, when we pray, it's not just us talking to the Lord. It's not just we're us speaking words to God, but we've got to shut down at some point and listen to what God has to say. And I have to say, most of my prayers are, are me speaking to God or worshiping, worshiping the Lord and then allowing Him just to be, for me to just be quiet and allowing Him to speak to my spirit, to speak to my heart. These are these three keys are, are, are what's going to break, break that, that bond or that bondage that Satan has on our mind uh, uh, as far as fellowship and as far as prayer and as far as maintaining that fellowship and that intimacy with God. We've got to make it about an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, not just to know of the word, but not be, 
Be known of Him. Be known by Him. Let the Word permeate through our being. Let the Word of God soak into our mind and into our heart. And then once that happens, then brothers and sisters, we can allow the Spirit to guide our actions. So it's got to be intentional. It's got to be intense and it's got to be intimate. We've got to allow those three things to guide that that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. When we seek the Lord, it says, seek first the kingdom of God. And as I've meditated on that scripture this week, I've thought about something. You know, we, we've got two boys, those of you who know us, and, and, and I'm sure people are listening to this that, that don't know us personally. But we've got two sons, and, and our sons, when, and when I was thinking about this, about seeking the kingdom of God, and the title of this message, The Power of First. You know, people are, there are some people that are so competitive. And everything they do, they try to be first, or they try to they try to gain an advantage because there's power. You look at, at, at the Super Bowl or, or an NBA championship or any kind of race or or anything that people do in the sports world or or literature or or authors or preachers or anything out there, there's always this sense of competition. And with that competition, we understand that that if we try to be the best that we can be. That there's power in that. Even in the secular world, we might not think that this can apply, but it absolutely does. What I was thinking about is our two sons. It seems like both of them are completely different. And both of them had di- have, had different interests from the time that they were children. You know, Brandon's was, was the banjo. It was athletics. David's was, was music. And, and, and now he's in photography and he's doing really well with, with teaching. He's got a memory that is, is amazes us and, and he, he does so good. And it's like both of them, everything they do, everything they try to do, I can see those, those three fundamental Things that they've put into practice, intentional, intense, and intimate. You know, I can I can remember Brandon when he was uh, twelve or thirteen or fourteen years old. On Saturdays, he would come. He wouldn't do anything on Saturdays. He would take his banjo into the room, and it would just be over and over and over, repetitious. Tell he about drove his me and his mom crazy. And Dave was the same way. We moved a few times back when the, they were uh, teenagers or preteens, and and we always had to find a place where David could play his drums. And so it seems like everything that they've done, they've applied these principles. And you look at people who, who have power in the world of sports or have power in the world of government. They've applied these three things to their life. They've made it intentional. They've made it intense. And they've made it in, intimate. There's been purpose in what they're doing. Well, brothers and sisters, if we're going to seek the kingdom of God, then we've got to apply these very same principles to our life. They've, we've got to be intentional, intense, and intimate. And, and our relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we do that, oh my goodness, if we can understand that, if we can apply these principles to the secular world, to the world out there, if we can take that same energy and that same passion and that same love and that same intention and that same intensity and that same intimacy with the things that's out in the world and apply them with the things of God, all the relationship, all the places that we can go in the Spirit that we've never reached yet. We're, listen, we're... As I've said several times in preaching this message, we're getting ready for the greatest event that's ever happened in the Christian world. And that's the rapture of the church. And we need to apply, we need to understand that we need to apply these these very principles to our spiritual walk with God. We don't just stumble upon a relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen like that. There's got to be purpose in what we do. And so I was thinking about these three things and I thought, Lord... If I, and you know, we don't want to look at anybody else's life. Don't, when you look in the mirror, there's nobody else there. If we as individuals, as members of the body of Christ, you know, there's things that, there's things that bother me about, about the things that's going on, not just in the world, but that's going on in the church. And you know, we, 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 sometimes we're too busy looking at what other people are doing instead of looking and focusing on ourselves. Yes, we understand that there's, there's problems everywhere and everybody's got issues. But you know, the thing about it that really bothers me is that, is that people want to judge and point a finger because they sin differently than somebody else. There's things, if we'll look in a mirror and be honest with ourselves, we'll, we'll look and be honest and say, there's things in my life. 
Not my neighbors, not this man, not the pastor down the street or somebody else. There's things in my life that I need to bring these three fundamental principles under and I need to apply those things to my life and I need to allow the Spirit of God to guide me and not look at somebody else. See, I praise the Lord that He's given us this chance to be able to look at ourselves in, in this time of reflection. I've heard people in the news, I've seen, heard reporters say, you know, they've taken this time to examine themselves. Well, Christians, brothers and sisters, as part of the church, as part of the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to understand that this should be a time, again, as I've said several times, a time of reflection. If we really want the unity that we speak about, if we really want the intensity and the anointing of God upon our life of, as individuals, upon our church, you know, God's not finished doing what He's going to do. There's many things, I believe, that are yet to come. But you know what? If we truly want these things to happen, if we want to not just be a witness to it but a participant of what God is doing then we need to apply these same principles to our life we're not going to just stumble upon a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ it doesn't happen that way it comes with it comes with dedication it comes with being intense about serving God and living for the Lord it comes with purpose and knowing and realizing and the biggest problem that most people have is not truly realizing their potential or what God has ordained for them to do and who they are in Christ we need to as Christians understand that if we belong to God then God wants to do these things in our life he wants our lives to be anointed. He wants our lives to be set apart. He wants our lives to be sanctified. You know, we, we can identify the problem, as I heard preached this morning. There may be all kinds of problems. But unless we apply these, these principles and walk in the Spirit, then brothers and sisters, we'll never be able to overcome the things that come at us. These The, the Word of God and the things of God has to be... We've got to have just as much passion about the things of God as we do out there in the world, as playing sports, as doing, as going hunting, as going fishing, as all the other hobbies that we do. We've got to be so much more passionate. I want to be able to walk in the Spirit. You want to be able to walk in the Spirit. If we want to be able to walk in the Spirit and not let anxiety and fear and, and addiction and all of these things have control of our life, then we come. if we become as passionate about what's going on out there as watching the news or being a afraid of what's going to happen or worrying about this or worrying about that if we can become as passionate about the things of God then brothers and sisters we will not be able to believe what God can do in our life it will be absolutely amazing I want to turn to the book of Obadiah you know I just kind of stumbled I don't know it was last week one day I kind of stumbled upon this book Obadiah is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And it's the smallest, it's the smallest book in the Old Testament. And in saying, uh, in saying, uh, uh, I want to read from Obadiah, I want to read Matthew 6 one more time. And it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. You know, it's talking about natural things. It's talking about our clothes and our food and our housing and all of these things. But see, that is a principle. That is a spiritual principle. It's a spiritual law. Just like the laws of gravity, just like all the laws that's in nature, all the things that we see that govern all the bodies in space and all the things that govern the physics and, and the chemistry and the biology and all those laws that govern the natural world. Well, there's certain things in the spiritual world that govern our spiritual life. And if we will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that means we've got to be passionate and intense and intentional and, and we've got to be intimate about the things of God if we do that then brothers and sisters all of the things that God has promised us in his word not just in the natural but all the blessings spiritually see that's what we should be after now you know there's not very many of us in our circle that, that I know of that struggle with the natural things and I know I do understand I'm not so naive that I don't understand there's people in the world there's people in the United States that do struggle for the basic necessities of life. But honestly when it comes right down to it. The spiritual. 
The spiritual is so much more important. That The spiritual, I have read through the scripture over and over and over again. Those who were, who were destitute in the natural, those who, who went hungry, those who, who saw, read Hebrews chapter 11, those that were killed for the gospel. See, the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said He would never leave us nor forsake us. It doesn't matter what we go through. I've read through the Fox's Book of Martyrs many times, and I've read so many places that these people were so destitute of the natural, but they were in so so in tune with the spiritual world that when it came right down to it, I, I read one where, where Polycarp, as he was uh, burning at the cross, his fingers and his face was melting off, and yet he was raising his hands and praying in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, there's a life, there's a world, there's something that is much more important than this natural world. If we can just get a glimpse of that, if we can just get a hold of that, just for one minute, for one second, if we can understand the importance of walking in the Spirit and being in fellowship with Jesus Christ, then see the things of this flesh and the things of the world, they don't mean anything. And I want to read in the book of Obadiah, and you know, if, if, again, it says, Matthew, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of, of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. When the book of Obed, Obadiah, it's about two, it's basically, to make, it a, to make a long story short, it's basically about two brothers. I used, I used the scriptures a few months ago about Jacob and, e, and Esau. And that's what the book of Obadiah is. It's about Jacob and Esau. And the theme, now keeping in mind the power of first, that's what the title of this message is. I want to keep continuity and, and, and what we're talking about, the power of first. And to speak about, before I read the scriptures in, in Obadiah, just to give you a little background on Jacob and Esau, and to, just to put paraphrase it, Esau was a man of the world. He was concerned about the natural things more than he was the spiritual. He gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup. But, J but Jacob wanted that birthright so much more. So, uh, so it, it, was, it was about, here was a man who, whose concern was on how he can get instant gratification. How many people do we know in the world and how many times even ourselves in our life have we, have we found ourselves in that same situation? But you know what? There's something, if we're a true child of God, if we've been born again by the Spirit of God, there's something that always stops us in our tracks and lets us know who we belong to. There's something that rises up inside of us and says, you know that you were created more for better things and greater things than this. Well, this is what this story is about Jacob and Esau. Esau was a man of the world. Jacob understood that there was something in the blessings of God. There was something in that inheritance that he had to have. And he was willing to do anything to get it. And so the, the, the little book of Obadiah, just one chapter, 21 verses, the theme of the book of Obadiah is choices and accountability. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. Again, the title is The Power of First. And I don't know if I mentioned, maybe I talked about it just a little bit, but when, even in the natural world, when, when, when we win, if you watch champions, uh, you know, I watched the, the Super Bowl and, and I've watched the NBA titles and I've watched, you know, what come to mind was, was when uh, Brandon used to race motocross. And I don't want to be but a minute. I want to get right into Obadiah. But Brandon, he, when he first started racing, you know, at first time he got third or fourth place. Second time he got second or third place. But after that, he was just win after win after win. And I mentioned this about my, my boys. You know, David's a drummer. He's one of the best drummers around in the area. Everything he does, it seems like he, he succeeds and he excels at it. Both of them are like that. But I was thinking about, about all the things, you know, they get out and play music and, and they... And they get out and, and Brandon, he was racing motocross and all these things. But what people didn't see was there was a lot of things that went on behind the scenes. You're, you're seeing me. You've seen other preachers stand up behind the pulpit and preach the word of God. You've seen people live a holy and a, and a, and a, a righteous life in the sight of the Lord. You've seen people live a dedicated life. But what, what we don't see is all the work that goes on behind the scenes. We don't see the countless hours that ministers stand and 
and they read God's Word and they pray and they meditate and they think about the things of God and they study God's Word. And people who live a dedicated life, we don't see the prayer time that they've spent in the prayer closet. We don't see the time behind the scenes of what makes brings people to that perfection. And when people do that, you see there's power that comes with it. In the natural, there's a natural power, just like I mentioned the Super Bowl or NBA championships or all of these things in the natural world. Even with the, even with our children, you know, the, the motocross and the drums and the music and the photography and all these things, the weightlifting, any, anything that is our passion that we do, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes before we can reach that place. We'll see living for God is exactly the same way. And that's why I'm reading from the book of Obadiah because we, we read about Jacob and Esau and the scripture says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And people take that and say, well, why would the Lord hate Esau? Well, there was a lot of things that went on behind the scenes. It wasn't that, that God just decided to hate even though he knew what was going to happen. That makes him God. That's who God is. He knows everything. But he knew the passion that Jacob would have. He knew the, the lack of passion that Esau would have. He knew the lack of dedication that would be in Esau's life for the things of God. But again, he knew what Jacob would do. He knew Jacob would do anything to receive that blessing. And I, I ministered a few months ago about Jacob. He had come to a point in his life where he left everything behind. And it says he crossed that river Jabbok and he, he went over to the other side of that river and he'd come to the end of himself. He'd, say, he'd, he'd fought and he'd tried and he'd scrapped and he'd struggled to get these blessings, but he'd done it all in a carnal way. He didn't realize the, the spiritual impact of uh, fundamentally he was right in what he was trying to do. He was trying to gain the blessings of God, the blessings of his father, the blessings of his inheritance, but he didn't realize that the blessings that God wanted him to have was a spiritual blessing, but he crossed that river that was a time when he came to a place where he said I can't go like this anymore I can't continue doing the things that I've done before God wants something different so the Bible says he wrestled with an angel until the angel blessed him and out of Jacob came or out of, out of out of Jacob came Israel, came the nation of Israel one of the greatest and most powerful the nation that Jesus Christ came out of because Jacob had put into practice the three principles, being intentional, being intense, and being intimate. He took an intimate knowledge in everything that he'd done to accomplish what he wanted. So here he was, he was wrestling with an angelic being. He was not going to let go. And so here's the story. In Obadiah, about Jacob and about Esau, about choices and about accountability. We go through our life, we can't just go through our life not making the right choices. Yes, I understand there's times in all of our life when we allow, when we do things that we look back and we say, I wish I'd have done different. But you know what? God is a God of res restoration. He's a God that will restore you. God, if you'll go to Him and humble yourself before Him, God is a God that brings back that peace. You may have lost your peace. You may have allowed choices to get you in a place where you woke up and you said, how did I get here? How did I get in this place? But God is a God that will restore you if you'll put into practice these three principles of the Scripture. So here's the story of Obadiah. If I can catch my breath for just a minute. Jacob wanted the blessing. And God blessed him. So I want to read about four scriptures in Obadiah. Obadiah 3, it says, The pride of that thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou, thou that dwellest in the cliffs of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? I've done a little research on that. I've watched, I've watched National Geographic about Petra, which is in southern Jordan, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But Petra was a place, Petra means stone. It means rock. Petra was a city that was carved out of solid rock. And, and the, the descendants of the, of the city of Petra were the descendants of Esau. They were the Edomites. And they, they had pride because they felt like their city 
was impenetrable. There was no way that they could be destroyed. As a civilization, they let their pride take control of their life. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's one reason why God can't work with some people sometimes. Because we, we've we let pride come into our life to where we know it all, we think it all, there's nothing that we don't have never considered. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says that, that pride cometh before a fall. These Edomites were so proud of their city. They were so proud of their race because they were warriors and they had hewn their city, their their buildings right out of solid stone. And not only that, they they made they were they were able to survive in a desert land where there was not much water. They had the ability to conserve water in this arid and dry place. So maybe in the natural they did have they did have a reason to be prideful. But it says here, the pride of thine heart has deceived thee. Verse 8, it says, Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the mount of Esau? Again, these are the descendants of Esau. Choices and accountability. You know, the scripture says, talking about accountability, Romans 14 and 2 says, we understand that we're going to be accountable before God. It says, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. There's many other scriptures. We're all going to give an account. Good, bad, indifferent, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter our, 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 our mental state. It doesn't matter our physical state. It doesn't matter what we've achieved in the natural world or in the physical, in the spiritual world. None of those matters. We're all going to give an account. But here's a part of the scripture that many people, they choose to leave out. We're held accountable one to another. I preached a message a few years ago and fighting for the, was fighting for the common good of the body. And you know what? There was such opposition against that message by satanic forces. I'm not talking about individuals, but Satan come against me in every way that he could, physically, emotionally, mentally, every way that he could to stop that. Fighting for the common good. Not only are we accountable to God, but we're accountable to each other. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Ephesians 5, 21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. James 5, 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. Who does not want to be healed? Who does not want, want to find that relationship with Jesus Christ? Who does not want to put, position themselves in a place spiritually where we can receive the blessings of God? I want to be frank here just for a moment. And man, making this statement. Accountability. Esau was being held accountable for his choices. But I want to say something, and I want each one of us to listen. There can never be unity in the body of Christ without accountability. I can't be out here doing my thing. You can't be out here doing your thing. This guy over here can't be out here doing his thing. We are held accountable to one another. And if we can let that sink in, then brothers and sisters, we can have unity. But there won't be it without it. We're held accountable to one another. I want to finish reading in Obadiah, and then I'll close. Verse 17. So Esau was held accountable. He said that, that this city, the Mount of Esau, was going to be brought down. It was going to be destroyed. He was held accountable for his decision. Brothers and sisters, we're all held accountable. We may not understand how...